What's the biggest thing that gives me pause? It's the water quality. Mm. You know, this business is really solid. I know we've got a solid product. We've got a solid goal, a theme. But the water quality, man, I mean, that's, this is an urbanizing basin. And in the cases of most areas in Puget Sound, when you get a lot of city built around the bay, the bay gets lost to shellfish. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. What is so special about Washington-grown oysters? We find out today when we talk with Steve Seymour of Drayton Harbor Oyster Company in Blaine, Washington. He shares the whole history of growing uh, oysters in Washington, as well as specifically in Drayton Harbor. And let me tell you, it's a story that has some serious ups and downs. Thank you for joining me here on the Real Food, Real People podcast. I'm Dylan Honkoop, and this is my journey all over Washington State to get to know the real people behind our food. So how do you describe the food that you produce? Oh. It's oysters. It's Oysters, meat. one of the most sustainable, delicious products on the face of the earth. <laughs> Explain that. Well, this Why? Little, well, this little animal is out here in our beautiful bay, and it, you know, we don't have to feed them. We do produce, you know, we start off with this little tiny seed that, you know, thumb, two millimeters, three millimeters in size, but then Mother Nature feeds them. So what these, these guys eat algae and phytoplankton and stuff and grow. They're converting all this real primary food source into something yeah. that us as people enjoy. Um, Gosh, they're just a little ball of health. They're full of zinc and iron and manganese. Um, they've got high levels of omega-3 fatty acids. They're low in cholesterol. Um, they're just almost the perfect food. And um, all you've got to do, all we have to do as people is keep our water clean. And uh, and that, yeah, I would talk more about this later, but that's, that's certainly one of our biggest challenges here. I mean, we, Oyster Day will keep... Truly, keep the doctor away. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. That are good for like, you. <laughs> forget your multivitamins to have an oyster. Yeah. They have all, <laughs> everything you need as far as those elements. They're a truly unique uh, critter. God bless the first man who tried to eat an oyster, right? Right, right. <laughs> well, um, but they are something that can, um, thinking about that, prehistoric times, yeah. somebody who did that, that is something that can be eaten raw. Yes. I'm sure that much more was eaten raw in <laughs> that era. Yeah, but, I mean, you think the but first... But oyster I, is still eaten raw to this day. Of course. That's, that's the... Um, that's what it's known for, right? Yeah. The raw oyster. And I don't know. There, I mean, we, I don't know, thousands of people come through here a, a month, and, and there's something about the stupid oyster. I mean, I don't know why. What's so unique about Drayton Harbor Oyster? I don't know. You know, we just had this oyster fest last week, and I, it was absolutely scary. We had a line going halfway down the Peace Portal at 11 <laughs> o'clock when we opened, and I had... I think we all looked at that and thought, oh, God, <laughs> how are we going to deal with this? And it's all this draw. I mean, it's, uh, you know, part of the surprise is that we draw. This has definitely become a destination spot. Mm -hmm. We didn't anticipate that. We knew we had a nice population north of us here. and but Because yeah, you're literally right <coughs> on the border. We're right on the border, you know, and there's two-plus million people within a half an hour. And, mm -hmm. and we are... You know, we certainly are the oyster farm. Uh, the closest Canadian farm is out on the island, about halfway up the island. And so, you know. So that's a ferry ride plus <laughs> probably an hour or two drive. Yeah, but once you get up into northern BC, there's, there's a number of lots of farms, but mm -hmm. nothing is as close as this. Right. And this is really, truly shared water. I mean, our bay water is as much Canadian as the U.S., right? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And so. Um, so, yeah, prior to COVID, I mean, at least half our business were Canadians. And, of course, then COVID came along in, what, 2018, and I thought, oh, boy, you know, all of a sudden restaurants were closing and everything was restricted, border closed. And uh, it was really, I thought, boy, this is going to be a journey. And <clears throat> But surprising to us, our business just continued to grow. Mm -hmm. and this was drawing now people just from the U.S. side. Right. And yeah, because the border was closed. The border was closed. And... and, and uh, I just like, really? I mean, we're having people coming to Seattle, King County, Snohomish County, across the 
country, people from Kansas and New York and everything, because they all heard about this Drayton Harbor Oyster Company. And, I, and, and again, I, we can't really explain it. Yeah. Um, we've just been the we've been the beneficiary of of just a lot of the social media stuff. And yeah. uh, social media is definitely a, a interesting whatever. I mean, right? um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I we did fine during COVID, and then mm. um, there, there are some silver linings there. First of all, we discovered that we can draw people from quite a distance. Yeah, uh, the city, you know, when they started saying outside dining only, um, the city came to us and said. How can we help you? And he said, "Well, we could use more of the plaza. Mm. These, yeah, because you know, you're right next to this gorgeous. Yeah, Blaine has these two lovely plazas. You know, the H Street and G Street. And to be honest with you, they were built about 15 years ago, and they were seldom used. And one of the reasons we relocated to this spot and worked with the builder of this building was because of the plaza. We thought mm -hmm. that would be an awesome public draw. Yeah, we never thought we'd be able to actually use." more of it for seating but covid provided that opportunity the city said what can we do to help and they said use more space and they said okay yeah. and so we kind of set that up and all of a sudden it was like this light came on for the community it's like man we have these beautiful plazas so now they can sit out here and enjoy a glass of wine or beer at sunset and where that yeah. didn't exist before and so now it's kind of like you know we're hoping and i think it has set an example of what this community can do with its current resources yeah. and um, so that's the silver lining and I don't know if that would have all moved that direction maybe ultimately but right COVID just accelerated it um, so I don't know I don't know where this conversation is going but anyway yeah oysters are a very unique food yeah <laughs> Native American certainly this area was really a key harvest area for our Native American neighbors yeah. and um, there's you know shell middens and and lots of those kind of artifacts around this bay um so and today i mean oyster culture in this bay started right around the turn of the 19th century early 1908 really? our sign you know established 1906 that wasn't us but that was the first actually incorporated oyster company and it was um founded by alaska packers which is across the bay right the old salmon pack so they actually had had a business called drayton harbor oyster company and um, and they started farming oysters here. And in that case, we had already already eliminated the native oyster, the little Olympia oyster mm -hmm. that was yeah. up and down the coast. Um, and we had all we so we started bringing in oysters from the east coast, the Virginica, to see if we could get those populations established here. And so we've got some great photos of of unloading boxcars out here on the end of the spit with barrels of oyster seed coming in mm -hmm. from the east coast. Wow. So they went with that product for a while. And then around the 1920s and 30s, we started looking at this Japanese oyster, the Pacific. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess, uh, ask my son when he gets here. <laughs> and anyway, um, and they were first brought into actually Samish Bay. It was the first spot in the, on the West Coast where really? the Japanese oyster was introduced. And, um, you know, long story short, that oyster now is the ubiquitous oyster up and down the whole West Coast. Mm. And it, it established itself. It does well. It grows fast. The little Olympia oyster um, him. is a, a real slow-growing little guy. And, you know, five years to that size. And then they, mm. they have a real different flavor. They're, they're kind of more zinky. I think it's like a galvanized pipe kind mm. of to me. Mm. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, so oysters started being farmed in this state, you know, in the early 1900s. And uh, if you go up and down the coast, you'll find a number of lots of actually of farms that have been in the family for 150 years. Crazy. So it's a, a very unique Washington product. Yeah. And um, Washington is the largest producer of Pacific oysters on in the country. Mm. Wow. So... It's a, a big industry, employs, um, I can't remember, 3,000, maybe 3,000 people, something like that. Mm -hmm. Sales, oh, I, I probably don't know the numbers, millions and millions and millions of dollars. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> so it's a, a pretty big industry. And you get out into Grays in Mason County, and it's, it's the biggest employer of those areas. We're small out here. We're, we farm 
have a 30 acre lease farm uh, right now maybe five to ten acres of it yeah and, uh, been farming it since the 80s and uh, how many acres are these big guys down <laughs> south well hundreds of hundreds acres? if not thousands wow we all know taylor right if you're in yep. whatcom county taylor shellfish down in chuckanut i mean that's just a little piece of their business their their primary location is down in shelton right and then they have farms up in british columbia and out on the coast in Wallapa bay they're probably I would, i'll bet they're probably one of the largest in the country wow and, and i've known the taylors ever since i started farming in the 80s uh, you know, uh, Justin Taylor was the kind of the matriarch, and then the boys took the company over. Now today they've, and then it was just kind of a small company, and and they've just have expanded to the point that they're they're very large. Um, but there's other other f- names to come across, Minerbrook and National, and all these that they've been around for a long, long, long time. Yeah. So it's um, a lot of tradition steeped in those in yeah. this industry. Well, but you, what you guys do at your scale, you provide that touch point. I mean, you cannot produce the scale, the quantity of oysters to, like, feed the masses that want to buy and eat oysters. You can provide some of them, but you provide an experience. Yeah, nor do we want to be that guy, right? Right, we, right. You know, when, we, when Mark, my son, and I got, you know, I've been farming out here since the 80s, and all of mm-hmm. my kids, the four of them, have all kind of worked off and on out here a little bit. Um, most of them didn't enjoy it. <laughs> Mark, I think, will be on later. If, yeah. Um, uh, he stuck with it. He, he's my youngest kid, and he's a fish biologist out of Humboldt State, which I also am, and mm-hmm. um, moved home to get a, a knee fixed after a soccer injury. But anyway, yeah. stuck around. And, and I had worked for the State Department of Fisheries for 20 years, doing a lot of restoration around Whatcom County and around the state, and then had got back involved with the oyster company and we can talk more about that history alone yeah. because there's yeah. some real real heroes in that story but mm-hmm. um we just you know we were doing wholesale at that point we didn't have any retail outlet we had little production coming off and we'd sell into seattle and different places and it wasn't it was just a little bigger than a hobby at that point and mm-hmm. and then our neighbor here tony andrews who has this little spot next door asked us if we'd want to rent this little 300-square-foot space to sell bags of oysters out of. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And I thought, huh, never thought about that, but yeah, sure. Well, long story short, quickly people wanted to say, well, can you open a few? So we got our food and license. And they said, well, do you have any beer and wine? So we got our liquor license. <laughs> yeah, okay, so we, now we were opening a little raw oysters, and people said, well, do you, can you cook them? So we invested in a barbecue and put it on the sidewalk. And the next thing we know, we had people sitting all up and down Peace Portal Drive eating our oysters and drinking our beer. And I thought, wow, <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. Um, but um, so then so then it just became obvious that maybe that was a niche there for us. Um, when you're in the wholesale market, you're competing with all the other growers up and in, down the, the West Coast. And, you know, when you're small, it's hard because you're kind of the, you're just kind of a fill-in. Right. And so... So the smart thing is recognizing that we've got 2 million people north and the whole Whatcom County area, and we may be the only, we are the only commercial farm in Whatcom County. Taylor's just on the border. But right. So it's like, well, maybe there's an opportunity to just stay local. <clears throat> and I think that's where we've discovered is, is our niche. And uh, so we don't have any intention of ever growing huge and being a big wholesaler. Yeah. Um, because I think there's plenty of market opportunity just stay on, at the retail level and providing a really farm-to-table product. You know, we really really work hard at having the freshest of product available. Um, the lovely part of oysters, again, is, you know, if you have them here for a few days and you don't sell them, they're happy as clams to go back out there. So oh, really? you can continue to rotate your product. Oh, wow. Keep them very fresh. <clears throat> yeah, which a lot of restaurants can't, right? I right? mean, you, you get 10 dozen oysters from... You know, S and H shellfish or something. Yeah. And, you know, if you don't use them up in a week, they're starting to get on the the rough side. But do you want to sell them? And you know, yeah. For our case, if we don't sell, they just go back out. And so we can continually rotate. And uh, that's really unusual in that sense. You know, yeah. if you pick an apple, you got you know, it's it's done, right? Yeah, totally. You know, um, I don't know what else 
that may be one of the few products that you can actually, that's a live product that you can rotate around and right. continue to keep fresh. That's a, that's a brand new thought. Here. <laughs> because I, but it's, That's it, amazing. It is actually true. So, I mean, so we can provide, you know, having the farm right here really the freshest. And maybe that's a piece of what makes, I don't know, people come here and say, man, the best oysters I've ever had. And I've been in, you know, Chesapeake Bay. I've been from Florida. I've been in the Achacoach Baba. And I, I go, what? But they just, you know... Quick time out here to thank our sponsors on the podcast. First off, a special event is happening this week. Tomorrow, in fact, the Great Washington Shakeout is happening at 1020 a.m. on October 20th. Tomorrow, Thursday, 1020 on 1020. Uh, so make sure you mark your calendar for it. Uh, even if you miss it, that's okay. There are other chances to participate. You just go to uh, shakeout.org slash Washington. That's the website. You can get a bunch of information. It's all about making sure you're prepared for an earthquake, whether it's the big one that we all fear uh, about coming one day here in, in Washington or, or in the Pacific Northwest, but also any other earthquake, small or large, you need to have a plan. You need to know what you're going to do in advance rather than waiting until it happens to figure out what you're doing. At that point, it's too late. So you can learn a lot. Again, at shakeout.org slash Washington. Uh, just a couple of things. If you post about it on social media, take a selfie and show, the, uh, show your friends that you're participating. Use the hashtag shakeout. Um, Wa Shakeout is their handle on Twitter and they're on uh, Facebook as well. Um, during the shakeout, at, again, tomorrow, 1020 at 1020 a.m., uh, they're encouraging people to drop, cover, and hold on wherever they are, work, home, school, walking in the park, at the mall, doesn't matter. Um, it's great to, to do this dry run to make sure you know what your plan is, how you would react, what you would do in the case of of an earthquake, the Great Washington Shakeout. Again, shakeout.org slash Washington. Go check it out. Also, Mana Insurance Group sponsoring the podcast, and a big thank you to them. They're all about the same thing, having a plan ahead of time so you know what to do if and when things go wrong and to make sure that you're protected if anything does go wrong. That's the whole mantra of Mana Insurance Group, not just reacting if things go wrong, but having that plan in advance to protect your family's financial future. And if you think about it, that's what insurance really does. At Mana, they don't just sell you insurance. They want to know about your life, how it works, what can best protect your family, whether it's auto, home, whether it's your farm, life insurance, health insurance. They work with all kinds of insurances. Uh, they have offices here in Washington State as well as California and Arizona. Check them out, manainsurancegroup.com. Dairy Farmers of Washington, also sponsoring the podcast. Thank you to them uh, and the work that they do day in and day out there to share the real stories of Washington dairy products and the hard work that farmers do here in the state to produce, I would say, the best dairy products anywhere. Um, I, there may be some that would uh, want to compete on that level, but uh, at least among the very best of the best here in Washington. And uh, you can find out why, not only the nutrition, but the sustainability, the soul that goes into it from the people producing these dairy products at Wa Dairy. Dot org. Finally, Washington Red Raspberries, uh, sponsoring the podcast. Thank you to them. That Those are my people. I grew up on a red raspberry farm. That was my dad. Uh, he, he farmed red raspberries. He was part of the Washington Red Raspberry Commission, which is the organization behind Washington Red Raspberries. So I know all about it. And, and if you're having Washington Red Raspberries, you know you're having the best of the best. Um, again, not a talking point from them, but something that I've lived and know um, and still know a lot of people producing the delicious red fruit um, that uh, Whatcom County here in the northwest corner of Washington State is kind of the, the capital of the country uh, for producing processed uh, frozen red raspberries. Check them out at uh, red ra uh, redraz.org. Now we get back to our conversation with Steve Seymour at Drayton Harbor Oyster Company in Blaine, Washington, here on the Real Food, Real People podcast. And what affects the flavor of your oysters? I mean, there's the species, of course. Well, that affects it. Yeah, it's the but species. Uh, uh, and I, m m more, I can't remember the, ever pronounce this word, but it's been shown that oysters, certainly because they are out here filter feeding, 
So they mm -hmm. pick up everything that's in your bay. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got real salty water, um, you know, they're going to be quite salty. If you have a lot of fresh water coming into your bay, they'll be less salty. So there's, that's one big difference. And, um, and then what they're eating. We even, out here, I mean, this, this bay cycles different algae species throughout the year. Um, so, and we see the taste, you know, at some points <laughs> they're sweet, some points they're more salty. Um, there's one little short time a year, maybe two weeks, where if you cut the oyster, it'll bleed red. And it's because it, what algae is out there gives it that pigment. Now, this mm -hmm. isn't the red tide. Right. This isn't the red tide. This is just some other dinoflagellate or something that tends to have a pigment that the oyster gets and it and it's unique we sold some when we were doing wholesale we sold some down in seattle and they said we can't take these you know it bleeds on us i says no 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 it's a marketing thing this is this is a two-week window where you have this yeah. oyster Super that unique. is different yeah. and uh so they so that's part of it um and in this case we have two little creeks to come in california dakota creek they're both lovely little systems they California drains around Ferndale area, and Dakota is up here and runs up into the border. Uh, they both support salmon runs, and but you know, so they provide a unique characteristic. Um, right. Yeah, so I don't know. It's just, and you can go to different parts of the country and eat oysters, and yeah, it's the species. As I said the Olympia oyster tastes quite zinky. Mm -hmm. The Virginica has a little different flavor. I mean, they're all going to be a little different. The Gulf Coast oysters are different. Mm. Um, so it's all just based on their environment. A little bit like a wine, right? Yeah. So different wines have different characteristics yeah. based on where they're grown. Terroir or whatever it is. Yeah, and here they, they call it memo. I, again, it's something like that. Yeah. But, um, and so people, you know, every day I hear, man, this is this oyster. And I go, I don't know. I, I, I'm, <coughs> your guys' oysters are amazing, but also it is the experience. Of, and, you know, I grew up in this county. Yeah. I didn't spend a ton of time in Blaine. But when you do come to Blaine, yeah. small town, yeah. historic town, yeah. you're looking out over the water. Yeah. And for whatever reason, it just makes you hungry for seafood. And to be able to come here, as I have done in the past, and be like, not only am I looking at the water and s craving some seafood, I'm eating seafood from that yeah. Bay. Yeah. I, that harbor. Yeah. I mean, it is all of that. I mean, you can have that same experience if you like. You go to Taylor, right? You're down there yeah. on their beach. Um, uh, there's, uh, I think a lot of oyster growers are seeing the retail side of this, like mm -hmm. uh, Hama Hama down in Hood's Canal, Hog Island down in California. They've all developed venues around their farm because yep. the public loves that, right? I yep. mean, you know, Bill Wood Acres, an apple grower, right? I yep. mean, it was the same kind of thing. You go out there and you're right in the middle of the orchard. Um, I think people are just hungry for, for having that kind of farm-to-table experience. You know, Blaine, uh, I just love this community. I mean, it's 5,000 people. You, you can actually affect some really cool things, you know, and yeah. the city council and the government is small enough that you just, you know, you know everybody. Right, you know, it is a small town. Everybody knows what you're doing. Yeah, some people don't like that. I love it. I it's mean, what I, I grew up with. I'm used I mean, to it. it's small town is just awesome, and um, and this small town, because as you mentioned, has all this amenities. It's just we haven't even touched. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, the commercial fishery is really the only major fishery we have here anymore. Is is the crab fishery, and it yeah. is major. And I think Blaine should and probably will develop a uh, build on that fact that we this is a big mm -hmm. crab landing area you know i'm we keep trying to push you know a, a crab fest you know this experience last week with this oyster fest and now nah, we got to do some other stuff we yeah. got to have a salmon fest and a crab fest or combine it you know bellingham does the sea feast which is cool right um but here you could just really s you know ah, it's mm -hmm. it, there's opportunities I and i agree i think people the community, it's changing. I mean, it's, um, 
you know, Semiamo is a relatively exclusive area, and and Little Blaine is a, a town that has struggled over the years with the economy and and stuff of that sort because it's so tied to the border. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, and it's kind of one of the last, maybe one of the last real marine seaport areas that is not just developed out to the hilt, and yeah. and and in that. We're not, and I'm speaking for myself mainly, I guess. I don't want to see a lot of corporate stuff here. Yeah. You know, my model is Edison. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Or LeConnor. I mean, it's yeah. it's all driven by local stuff and for its unique. And um, so we're hoping, and this is kind of a model. There, there's certainly other opportunities to create some really unique spots. I think we have a few of those in town now that are are seeing that and they're saying okay this is where we want to go um so i don't know it's um I, yeah i think <coughs> you guys have already tapped into an opportunity that no one necessarily knew really existed and i think there's so much more yeah. that can be done i mean with what you guys are doing but this whole town this whole community and its connection to food from the sea Food from the sea, and you know, you, it, it wouldn't be a big stretch to do food from the land either. I mean, yeah. there's just, yeah, we all have different visions, and and every time we do something, again, like the Oyster Fest, I think it, you know, we had, we kind of recruited this six other restaurants in town to do oysters that day, so we provided, I don't know, eighty or ninety dozen oysters to these guys at no cost, and said, just cook them. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a contest, you know. We're going to have the best oyster, and I'll and we won't be part of it, only because I didn't want to lose. <laughs> <laughs> I just I know there's some really creative chefs in this town, and I didn't want to compete against them. Um, but uh, and I didn't know if they'd really get that excited about it, right? I mean, everybody is so short staffed right now and busy, and um, but we did it, and we had these little passport books and stuff, and and these guys just really stepped up. It was amazing. And and they were blown away, right? I mean, they all we were all surprised by the Oyster Fest pop people that came here to plane. Every restaurant in town was just like busting at the seams that day. I mean, they all go like, "Wow!" You know, yeah. they're they're so grateful. I mean, it's almost embarrassing. They were so grateful to us for for bringing all these people to town, right? And um, but it makes sense <coughs> because yeah. then everyone <coughs> rises together. It does, and then. And then I thought, out oh, of the contest, you know, that there, nobody's going to be serious about that. But we we uh, we presented awards yesterday to the top two. But every every one I went to was a, who won? Who won? Who won? They were so excited. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, golly Moses! I mean, this stuff just keeps continually surprising me. Yeah. But um, so it was awesome, and they all want to say, "What are we doing next year?" <laughs> you know. So I go, huh. Easily next year we could double or triple the people in town now that the word is out. And mm -hmm. so we got to, you know, we got to really think this through because yeah. we, we, we barely survived that day. Right. <laughs> I yeah. think I had all my family working and all my employees. I had 40 some odd people working that day. And, um, uh, it could have gone sideways in so many ways. <laughs> it was just yeah, that's always the case though yeah. with with events of of oh, size. No matter God. how much you prepare, <laughs> there's always something that could go. And we're, but you know, there's some people who make a a career out of this kind of planning. Well, we yeah. don't, right? Yeah. And it was just yeah. like, oh my goodness! <laughs> Thank God I got a big family. Yeah, <laughs> but awesome. anyway, it was it was cool. Uh, but yeah, this town, it's it's kind of like what. What do we want the vision to be? Mm -hmm. I want it to keep its culture, yeah. you know, its history, its working waterfront. I really don't want to see just condominiums, you know, replacing all of this working waterfront area and, mm -hmm. and folks don't, who really aren't tied to its history. Yeah. Uh, ideally, we would continue to have this culture that it made Blaine the small little place it is. Um, but this pressure is there, right, to... to put condos everywhere and have it kind of become this, well, whatever. <laughs> well, it's the very farthest <coughs> northwest corner 
yeah. of the country. Yeah. So that that's another factor too. This is as far northwest as other than Point Roberts, but that's a different experience entirely. Yeah, yeah but you got to realize the pressure. You got two big urban areas, Seattle and Vancouver, yeah. just whole Whatcom County, really, right? Just pressuring Whatcom County to change from its yeah. roots to something yeah. different. And maybe it's just ultimately will happen, but, um, you know, we're going to try to play a part in, in trying to keep it really a marine-centered yeah. yep. cultural area, if we can. <clears throat> so let's go back. Yes. I want to hear about the beginning of you farming, but let's uh, go back even before that. You were a fish biologist? Yeah, I spent, you know, I came to Whatcom County in 1977 to, to work for the Lummi Indian tribe. Mm -hmm. So I spent 10 years, 12 years running their whole salmon and aquaculture programs. Yeah. I loved it. I had, you know, 20 some odd tribal folks as employees and and Lummi was really unique at that time. They were a tribe that, again, trying to hang on to their roots, which is yes. a, a large fishing nation or community. And so they had ventured into the realm of aquaculture, mm -hmm. shellfish and salmon. And salmon aquaculture at that time was just cutting edge. There was companies like uh, Dom Sea Farms and, and uh, anyway, people trying to do ocean ranching of salmon and yeah. pin rearing salmon to compete with the rainbow trout industry out of Idaho and all that stuff. So Lummi got involved in it. They built this 750-acre diked-in pond, which today you would never be able to build, with the idea mm -hmm. of farming shellfish and salmon in this seawater pond. All very, very cutting edge at that point. And, and they built a large salmon hatchery up on the South Fork, which continues today to be one of the more productive coho programs probably in the country. Um, so I, you know, as a young biologist just finishing up a graduate degree, I was working in a little small hatchery in California, came up here to, <laughs> to run this program. Where did, where did you originally come from? Um, where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in Southern California. Southern California. And then I moved up into Humboldt County in California to finish a grad degree at Humboldt State and then worked at a small salmon hatchery as a fish culturist. Did you have any farming or fishing background from your youth? No, no, not really. I was a city boy down in Glendale. <laughs> Wanted to be wow. Jacques Cousteau. Yeah. So I went to, off to college to be a marine biologist. Yeah. And, um, didn't even know really what that meant. But, and I but don't look know where that's led. But anyway, well, we, anyway we yeah, get the whole it's, story. it's interesting. So I get up into Whatcom County, and I remember driving up, chucking a drive to be, for the interview with Lummi. I, I kind of got recruited from Lummi. I, I got this letter in the mail from what was called LIGHT, Lummi Indian Tribal Enterprises, mm. asking me if I was interested in applying for the job of technical director of their aquaculture program. First of all, I had no idea where Bellingham was, so I pull out a map. I go, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> Way up there. Lummi tribe. I'd never worked for a tribe before. I had no idea. I came up here, and my wife and I drove up, and we came up chucking it drive. And that's when I really started getting excited <laughs> about this job, right? I just like, whew. And... Um, uh, it was interesting. So anyway, long story short, I got hired to run this program, and it had 20-some-odd tribal employees. Lummi had really gone. They had sent a lot of their staff off to school at NOAA Fisheries and stuff to learn aquaculture and diving and all this stuff. So there was you know, a cadre of trained tribal folks that were in the middle of the, one of the more advanced, cutting-edge sciences in the world. Yeah. And, and um, as I... With a large saltwater pond, a huge freshwater hatchery, a cutting-edge shellfish hatchery. It's like, I mean, it was just like a, a dream, right? Yeah. And um, so anyway, we, you know, took the job and came to Billingham and, um, and had 10 wonderful years working with these tribal folks. But unbeknownst to me, Lummi, um, and I don't know if you're even old enough to remember the Bolt decision, <coughs> yeah. which the Judge Bolt had given the the Washington tribes, 50% of the harvestable salmon in the state. Right. <laughs> it was a, a mini war um, um, between the, you know, the non-treaty and treaty folks. And Lummi happened to be at the tip of that spear. They, mm. they were the ones that led that whole bolt decision. Right. And I had no idea about all this treaty stuff and everything. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden I'm working with some of these guys, tribal guys who were just... Oh, super dynamic. I mean, Sam Keggy and and um, 
uh, Kinley, Forrest Kinley. I mean, they just, you know. I was with Lummi for like three weeks, and I went back to Washington, D.C. with the tribal chairman to raise money. For, here I am, a young guy. I, you know, I'm bouncing around D.C. meeting with Scoop Jackson and Magnuson and all these guys. Wow. And I'm going like, whoa. Anyway, wow. awesome. It was just awesome. But anyway, I spent 10 years or so with them, and then I took a job with the State Department of Fisheries mm-hmm. to, to set up these regional fish enhancement programs, which turns out like NC, the Nooksack right. Salmon Group. So me and another bio with charge was setting up these groups around the state. And uh, every one of those groups, 30 years later, is still in existence. I think we all know about NC. I mean, yeah. they just have really made a dent in the landscape. They're, they, they're so, so effective at working with everybody, farmers and landowners and, yeah. and um, an awesome, awesome organization. And, you know, they just celebrated their 30th anniversary, right, which is just crazy. Yeah. So... Um, I cannot drive around this county without seeing some project that, you know, that I've touched. So, I mean, right. I'm, just, I'm just so lucky. Um, so after that, I spent 20 years with fisheries and then retired. Started farming oysters out here in the 80s with a, another guy who's a hero, Jeff Menzies, which mm-hmm. probably a lot of you folks have heard of. Jeff was, is really the hero in this whole thing. Jeff spent a lot of time on my dad's farm. Yeah. Back in his days of being involved in IPM. Right, right. right. Um, consul- I forget who he was working for at that time, but my dad got to know him really well. Yeah. Really, really liked Jeff. Just a super man. And, yeah. you know, we got to be almost like brothers. We spent, you know, lots and lots of night tides out here picking oysters. And, yeah. And, um, but, you know, the bay. So in the 80s, we took over the lease that a couple of Canadians had had. And, and started farming oysters, and then about, oh, t- early 1990, maybe, the bay got closed because of water quality issues, mm-hmm. and so basically put us out of business. Um, I had already gone to work for the State Department of Fisheries at that point, so I was kind of off onto a little tangent. My oldest son was working with Jeff out here. Mm. Um, Jeff, you know... He, said, I, you know, I'm going to work at getting this bay reopened. I mean, and so he partnered up with Betsy Peabody, the Puget Sound Restoration Fund, and they took on the task to go with a goal of opening the bay in three or four years to at least seasonal harvest. And had he not stuck with it, I suspect we would not be farming today. I yeah. mean, you know, he, Jeff... Jeff was very effective, but he was the sharp stick. And mm. there are a lot of folks who thought, man, you know, I don't want to see this man, right? I mean, because right. he would push, push, push. Mm-hmm. They identified the problems. You know, it was failing septics. There was some manure management issues upstream. Yep. It was a sewer treatment plant out here that was a disaster. Uh, we had a big main going across the bay that we'd never know whether it was leaking or not. And... Um, and then stormwater issues. But it was mainly the, the manure, the sewer plant, and se- septic tanks. All that hillside was, was on septics. And, and there was no, at that point, any inspection program and everything. So you fast forward today, the farms all have manure management plans. They do a pretty, a pretty good job. We've got a brand new sewer treatment plant over here now that's state of the art. It's a, it's a reclamation plant. The idea is that they reclaim the water and it's used throughout the watershed for, well, right now it's all used to water the golf courses in the summertime. Right. Um, but this water comes out of that plant almost drinking water standards. Wow. State of the art. I mean, the city spent way more money than they had, $30 million plus yeah. on that plant. Um, so they did the right thing. And, and then all the septics now, if you have a septic tank, you probably know this. You've got to have it inspected every one or three yeah. years, depending on what kind of system it is. And so that, that's just, just been some major changes. But it's only because, really, Menzies and Betsy Peabody. I mean, um, so anyway, they're, the, they're really the heroes. And uh, so. So when did you get back into actually well, farming I, again and, and this current iteration of the yeah, whole thing? Yeah, when yeah. did that really Well, then I retired wings. in 2013 from the fish program. And Jeff, at that point, was running the farm as a nonprofit, uh, community-supported agriculture-type program, CSA. 
Yeah. So people would come in and buy shares, right, in exchange for oysters. So when I retired, Jeff says, "Hey, you want to kind of take this back over?" He says, "I'm just tired." And yeah. Um, I said, well, I'm retired. I guess I got time, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so I did. And so I ran the CSA community thing for a, a year or two. And then Mark, he was that living down in uh, uh, Humboldt County, finished up his degree and worked, was working for Simpson Timber as a fish bio. And as I said earlier, he came home to get a knee repaired. And, and while he was home, I said, you know, why don't you just hang here? And yeah. we'll, let's take this business for, for profit. So he agreed. So that was around 20, might have been 2013, 2014, I don't know. So, so we did that. We've, we've incorporated um, with the farm, Drayton Harbor Oyster Company, uh, LLC, and uh, started farming oysters again and doing wholesale work in, out of Seattle and around town. And, and then, as I mentioned, you know, um, Tony Andrews offered us this spot to do retail. Mm-hmm. So we okay. So now we started doing, you know, retail. Um, I think that's kind of the story. And and so, and then, twenty seventeen, a guy walked into our little shop and said, you know, "I just bought the building next door. Hmm. Would you want to be a tenant?" And of course, I said, "You know, Mark and I had, had our eye on this. This was an old real estate office. It was. We thought we could probably renovate this building, but." The owner at that time really was not interested in going to the restaurant stuff because restaurants are complicated with all the, all the stove and all that. Yeah. And all the, it, it gets very expensive. Yep. And uh, so he wasn't interested, but the new owner was. And that's Peter Giante, um, who then we, we thought we could use, all of us thought we could use the old building, and then, but he wanted to put a apartments upstairs and Mm -hmm. the old structure wouldn't take that so we took down the old building and but we salvaged all the material that was that we could out of the building because we wanted to build something that was somewhat unique in a way that fit what we thought looked like Blaine yeah so all this floor all the wood all the sidings are out of the old building this is this is old growth fir it's 120 years old beautiful wood and and uh, and Peter, you know, bless his heart, he went along with our crazy ideas about building something that was like this. I mean, a lot of builders would have thrown up something and said, here. Yeah. And Yeah, why go to the trouble? <laughs> he went to a lot of trouble, a lot of additional expense to really give us a place that was cool. And, and all, everything you see inside is my son's work. So this place already has a lot of soul, Yeah, you know. And since we, and we opened in 20, in May of 2018, and um, we've had, I don't know, a dozen family events in here. So this place does have a lot of soul already. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it kind of feels like our home. So when mm-hmm. we have customers in, it's kind of like, come on into our place. And, mm-hmm. and I think that probably translates into the, into the whole vibe thing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, kudos to Peter. I mean, he, he stuck with us. And uh, so here we are. And... Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we opened, and then, what, eight months later, COVID came along, and it's like, okay. But again, we're through that, and we've we learned a lot of lessons. we got a great staff. We've got, ah, gosh, I think I write 30 checks every two weeks wow. to employees. Uh, two-thirds of them are under 21 years old. A lot of them are still in high school. Uh, it's a good job. I mean, all the tips are pooled. Mm. And so the dishwasher, the folks who run around picking up, make almost make the same money as everyone else, and they 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 pull in a good, you know, twenty five to thirty dollars an hour. Good. and that's the way it should be. It that is that's awesome. It, it just brings me, it really brings me a lot of internal joy when I write these checks to these young kids, mm-hmm. and um, they're all really good. It's fun to see a young person come in who's maybe maybe never had a job mm-hmm. and gosh to see the personal growth in these young people over the year or so they might hang here is pretty satisfying this is bridge funding most of these people are going on somewhere else you know to college to nursing school right. to 
you know, certified teachers going off to find their first teaching job. We're fortunate that our menu is simple. You know, it doesn't take very long for, for just about anybody to learn how to grill an oyster or, or do what we do. There's nothing fancy about this place. Um, sometimes I think, ah, that's tough. I wish I had a full-time kitchen crew who right. didn't have to continue to be training, but this is what it is, and I think it, it, I think it adds to maybe the uniqueness. Maybe people love us because we're so, um, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> okay, or I don't know. We just, we don't really know what we're doing. We just stumble bumps. <laughs> I think, I, you know, it doesn't come across hokey at all. I think it just comes across as authentic. You're real people. Authentic, it's, it's, that's it. And it's not, yeah, yeah, there's nothing contrived about this. Yeah, that's true. There is nothing, yeah. So... Um, it's it's amazing. I still have to pinch myself every day to think, <laughs> this is ours, dude. Yeah, <laughs> crazy. But with that comes a lot of responsibility. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, yeah. And anyway, so, you know, back to the farm. I mean, what's the biggest, what's the biggest thing that gives me pause? It's the water quality. Mm. You know, this business is really solid. I know we've got a solid product. We've got a solid goal, a theme. But the water quality, man, I mean, that's, this is an urbanizing basin, and in the cases of most areas in Puget Sound, when you get a lot of city built around the bay, the bay gets lost to shellfish. Um, mm. Is that an ultimate thing that's going to happen here? I hope not. I mean, you would think that with all the rules and regulations now in place, a community should be able to live along its bay without poisoning its water. Yeah. Um, Blaine, well, what I, about... Farming on land, though, too. I mean, because you're talking about urbanizing, yeah, and what that the effect on the watershed and ultimately on the water quality in the bay. But you also talk about the history of working with farming and and keeping manure from yeah. dairies and and yeah. beef farmers upstream, up in the watershed, yeah. out of the bay. Yeah, I mean, it's a toughie. I mean, I I I have a deep appreciation for dairy and farmers. Because they do have manure that they got to deal with, and they want to put it on the land. Um, certainly, in the old days, it was a huge issue. I mean, because there was, you know, there were manure applications throughout the year, right? And I think we've all learned that, you know, you, if you put manure in the middle of the winter time, all it hmm. does is run off the land and into the stream. Um, so, you know, as the farmers know, and now the rules are fairly restrictive. You know, you've got to do applications during the dry season and demonstrate that it's needed and blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I think we, uh, And I don't know this number. It might be a half a dozen dairy farms still in the watershed. I, it's not like it used to be. A lot of yeah. those farms have unfortunately moved on yeah. um, because regulations have become so restrictive. Mm. At least that's what I hear. Um, we have a number of dairy farmers that are <laughs> customers here, you know, quite frequently. Yeah. Um, I think we all share, you know, we all share the, the love of the land. And um, so I view farming is, it, it's, not, it's not the issue that it used to be. And I think mm. that's through the good work of the conservation district. My God, we're so blessed to have, yeah. you know, the district here, you know, I mean, George retired now, but George Boggs took that district from, just made it a standout. Yeah. And, um, and his staff are just amazing. And, and so, you know, there's lots of tools now. And, and that certainly goes to the, to the hobby farmer, too. In fact, maybe that's almost more of an issue now, I think. I mean, mm. um, but from the urbanizing piece of it, it's the stormwater stuff that's tough because it's really the hardest to control. And when you have these big rain events, particularly the freshets of the first of the year, there's a lot of stuff in the water that turns the bay a little bit upside down. You know, we, as a business practice, when we get any kind of significant rain, we back off on the raw product. Mm -hmm. We don't want people eating raw oysters that might have high levels of virus or bacteria. Well, that's what's so fascinating. Like, it comes and goes through shellfish. It's yeah. not like, okay, you know, it gets some bacterial whatever through the water. Yeah. It can flush back out of that yeah. oyster then. Yeah, oysters are filtering upwards of 40 or 50 gallons of water a day. And so, you know, yeah, they pick it up, and then with clean water, they extrude it. So, 
and you know, cooking product deals with all those virus and bacteria issues. So, when, again, when we get significant rain, we just back off on the raw. Um, yeah. We just insist that everything gets cooked. Um, and if it gets really bad, we just back off on oysters, period. And yeah. we see it out here. Being on this bay every day, you can see when the bay gets insulted. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, there's a definite change. And, and so, you know, we just, we just cannot afford to, to have a bad product out here. So we do whatever we can. Um, you know, we've done different, over the years, we've tested sediment and things for, for different contaminants. And, uh, and it, it never has been an issue. The contaminants, the sediments seem to come back clean enough to yeah. support, you know, food production. Um, yeah, so, you know, the history, I mean, if, if, I mean, Blake could almost be a model of an urbanizing basin that still has certified shellfish growing areas in its watershed. Yeah. That's fairly unique. Um, there's a lot of places around the country, Chesapeake Bay, that, you know, for years has been kind of closed and they're trying to recover it and they're trying to recover it by putting oysters in it because oysters do in fact filter the water um uh, new york harbor used to be the mainstay of the whole Mm. oyster industry in the country and uh, today it's it's still just you know so i'm hoping you know i may be i'm not i'm the optimist but i am hoping that we are able to keep this bay functional and the other surprise about this place is that, you know, when Jeff and I were farming out here, we were out here in the middle of the night a lot of times doing wholesale. Nobody really knew we existed. And uh, having this, all of a sudden it dawned on us like, wow, this is, this draws people's attention to that. And it has been so powerful in bringing this community on board. Because I, th- I think I'm right. This most folks in Blaine love this fact that they have an oyster farm right, right in their backyard. Right. They got this place here on the plaza where they can sit and slurp an oyster and drink a beer and enjoy it. And it's only because that bay is clean. You know, I mean, if the bay went away, we could probably bring oysters in from Taylor, you know, and do it. But it wouldn't be the same. Right. And, and so, so everybody's got a stake in it then, keeping I, it clean. I, I hope so. I think they do. Um, it mm-hmm. certainly has helped. It's a tool that Jeff and I never had. And, um, and it's so easy. I mean, there's so many times we talk to customers about where these oysters come from, you know, right out there, really. And then you get that, then you get this whole opportunity to talk about the story, you know, of all the, all the work of Jeff and Betsy and those people in the past and the community's investment and time and energy and the volunteer that, that has kept this bay available. Yeah. So it's, um, it's an uh, awesome opportunity. But we'll see, yeah. right? I mean, time yeah. will tell. I'd love to think 50 years, 60 years when I'm long gone, history and stuff, and my son will be sitting here talking about, ah, oh, I remember those. You know, I'd love <laughs> to be thinking that that would be the case. Yeah. Um, we'll see. Time will just tell. Well, thank you for what you're doing here. Uh, yeah, well, thanks for giving me the opportunity yeah. to carry on like a well, crazy and, old man. <laughs> and, and, well, and, and thank you for sharing that whole story. Because it makes what's happening here in the immediate so much more rich in, yeah. in meaning yeah. and value. So I, I appreciate you taking the time. I know yeah. you're super busy. Yeah. But to be able to sit down with me and, and, and share the story, it's yeah. pretty cool to hear. Well, thanks, Dylan. I mean, I again, every opportunity, you know. Yeah. We actually, and maybe Kat mentioned to you, we've got a public hearing tomorrow, actually, with a hearing examiner for a an additional eight acre site out here in the Bay. And, uh, you know, it's important to us cause it, it moves us to what we think is the cleaner part of the Bay cause it doesn't yeah. have so much influence from the stormwater issues. Mm-hmm. It is a floating culture system. So it's going to be on the surface, which we'll see, you know, yeah. people have to look at it. And, right. um, it's also up in 12 feet of water. So it, uh, doesn't impact eelgrass, which is a huge issue out here. And so, yeah, we'll see. I mean, um, we'll see. <laughs> I'm excited to see what happens. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Thank you again. Thanks again. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. These are the stories of the people who grow your food. 